Good morning. We welcome you in the name of Christ, in whose name each and every one is heartily welcomed, and from whom no one is turned away. What a great and glorious time it is to be in the house of the Lord. In case you hadn't already figured it out, we're going to be having the cantata this year, and it's woven within the worship, so we're so grateful for the work of our musicians and our choir, so we're very glad to have you. Just a couple of announcements I'd like to share with you. The first is about the Christmas Eve services. There are three services on Christmas Eve, 2, 7, and 11. The 2 and 11 are traditional worship, and the 7 o'clock is contemporary. So we hope that one of those times fits into your schedule. And then on Christmas morning, as is our tradition, we invite anyone who wants to come over for worship and breakfast to our home at 1030. If you're planning to come, please let me know today so I can put in an extra egg or two, and we'll uh, be glad to welcome you to our home. If there are no other announcements, let us do that for which we came. Let us make this a time of the Lord, a time for the Lord's Holy Spirit to settle over us and change our lives. You will notice that there are places where you will join in the singing, and David will cue you in to participate. Let us now center and focus on the presence of the living God. Sweet. 
we stand. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord God, and come. With your abundant grace and might, free us from the sin that hinders our faith, that eagerly we may receive your promises. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated, and will the children come forward? As the children are leaving for Children's Church, I invite you to sing verse 4 of hymn number 240. Yeah. 
This morning's first lesson is from Romans 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all God's beloved in Rome, who are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Please rise. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. Matthew chapter 1. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relationships with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us pray for the blessing of the Spirit to anoint the Word. Come, Holy Spirit, and settle over us. Come and fill our hearts and be within us so that our hearts would be open to hear from you, that this might be your Word for us today, and that it would change our lives. Amen.
several years ago, I received, I think, the very best Christmas card I've ever seen in my life. I wrote it down so that I would never forget what it said. And periodically, I like to remind you because I think it's such an important insight into the gospel. The front cover of the card showed a beautifully decorated tree and just all ornate. It was really gorgeous. And the caption said, when all of the tinsel and and glitter has shrunk away, has fallen away, and then you open it up and there's panels. And in each panel, more and more parts of the trees sort of just fall away. The decorations go away and the branches fall off until the very last panel shows just the single trunk, now bare, and two branches left, and they form the shape of a cross. And the caption there reads, Then God's real promise shines. When all of the tinsel and glitter has fallen away, then God's real promise shines through. Birth is a miracle. Anyone who's ever seen a birth or experienced a birth or held a sleeping baby in their arms and looked down at that child with love knows that every single birth is a miracle. Part of the reason it's a miracle is because it just connotes life. It just transfuses us with life. Many years ago, a a favorite man of mine by the name of Dale was in the hospital dying. He had a very small family. He was quite elderly, and all of his family was gathered around his deathbed. His daughter told me later that at the precise moment that the monitor showed that his heart stopped, that he had died, at that very precise moment over the hospital loud system came the lullaby song. And she said to me, it is so powerful to me, it just seems so right that God would send a baby to replace my dad. I think we look at birth somehow in that way. But whatever birth means to us, it is even more than maintaining the species. It's more than perpetuation of something that we might have maintained. There's something existential about it, something very to the heart, mind, and soul of us. So while it does seem that we're hardwired to maintain the species, and that's why we'll do nearly anything to protect our young, even so, that which is existential, at least for those of us who give God a place in the universe, birth somehow translates as a reminder that God is still at work bringing life, that God is still affirming the meaning of life, that God is still with us making life sacred, and that when we see life in this form, we know that as helpless as we are, something powerful and wonderful is going on in God's world. Matthew brings us to understand the meaning of the birth of Jesus in kind of an intriguing way. The first thing I think that you should notice about the text for today is that Matthew doesn't have very many details. His details are sparse. For example, if you had only Matthew, you would know nothing of the humble birth of Jesus, the fact that he's born and placed in a cattle stall or a manger or a cave or whatever we want to call it. And you would have no way of knowing the reason that the young couple made this long and sort of treacherous trip to Bethany. Uh, Bethlehem. You know, in today's world, your doctors wouldn't let you pregnant moms go that far, even by car probably. But here she is walking that distance late in her pregnancy. You find out only from Luke why that happens, but not from Matthew. And from Matthew, you can't learn anything about the announcement to the angels. I mean, the angel's announcement to the shepherds, not even about the shepherds. So it's a sparse detail, and when you look at it sort of carefully, and you read it kind of with an ear for the meaning behind the text, you realize that what Matthew has done is taken away the tension and the drama of the event. The tension and drama that would be there in any birth, much less the birth of the Son of God in a cattle stall. So he's eliminated that, and you begin to ask yourself, why would that be? What point is he trying to make? Well, biblical scholars tell us that the reason Matthew removes the tension and the drama and writes in this kind of a style is because he recognizes that people know the rest of the story so it doesn't have to be told again, and also that what he wants us to know, those details are not necessary because his point is to teach us who is Jesus. Who is this Jesus? 
anyway. And the whole of the gospel, beginning in the birth story, embarks on a lesson of who Jesus is, what he does, and how what he does connects with all of the promises of God. So Matthew does this in such a wonderful way. He sets about to teach us who Jesus is for us. It's an issue of his identity. And he does that by placing in the story and helping us to understand the meaning of three characters, Joseph the angel and Jesus by way of his naming. So first, Joseph. The text tells us right off the top that Joseph is a righteous and merciful man. That's pretty important. Righteous means he's law-abiding. That is to say, he observes and follows all of the Jewish customs and all of the Jewish laws. So he's attending to the Jewish law. And that's a pretty important thing to know about him because in that century, a betrothal was as binding as a marriage. The couple didn't live together. She lived with her parents still, and the husband-to-be lived in his own home, but during the time of their betrothal, they are as bound together legally as if they were already married. So in fact, if you're going to break a betrothal, you have to get a divorce to do that. So when he learns that Mary is pregnant, he knows he hasn't been with her. The only option for him is to imagine that this girl that he is going to marry has been unfaithful to him. And he sets out to try and figure out what he's going to do about that. His answer reveals both that he is law-abiding and merciful. Because you see, under Jewish law at the time, he has really only two legal options. He, He doesn't have an option to do nothing. His options are either to divorce her or to have her stoned. Both of those options are pretty bad for Mary. One of them takes her life and the life of her unborn child. And the other one consigns her to a life of suffering and poverty and misery and having to make a living for herself either by begging or by being a prostitute. It's not a good outcome for Mary, either of the ways that he might choose to keep the law. And so Joseph makes a decision that he is going to divorce her. But he does it with mercy in his heart. You know this because he already chose divorce over stoning her, which is by far the better option. But then you know the depth and extent of his mercy because what he chooses to do is divorce her quietly. And that's a way of saying he's going to do everything he can to keep from publicly humiliating her. It's a bad situation. It's about as bad as you could be for a woman at that time. And he's going to do everything he can to make it be less of a train wreck. So he decides he's going to divorce her quietly. And so from this, you learn the depth of the man's mercy. He is attempting to keep the law as he understands it and be law-abiding and righteous. And yet he is also filled with mercy. And from this, we are to recognize that Jesus' heritage from the day of his birth forward is righteousness and mercy. You cannot understand Jesus without recognizing his righteousness and his mercy. It's part of his family heritage. He learns it at the knee of his father. It's how he was made and how he was raised. Now, that tells us something. If we take this story seriously, it means for us that we also are called to be righteous and merciful. And when I say righteous, I don't mean self-righteous and judging. I mean righteous in the way that God would have us be, loving what God loves, desiring what God desires, open to what God is doing. When we are righteous in that manner, then we are following this one whose birthday we are about to celebrate. But our righteousness is always, always filled with mercy. Now understand that in the culture of that day, for him to make this choice to um, eventually not only not divorce her quietly, but to marry her, is really an incredible statement because it means that the rest of the world will look at him as shamed and humiliated. I mean, can't you just imagine his neighbors going around saying, look at Joseph, what a fool. Can't you just hear that? Well, it teaches us and reminds us that when we are followers of this God, we do what pleases God, and sometimes the world will think we are foolish for doing that. And sometimes the world will look at us as if we are shamed by doing that. 
But I want to tell you, and I tell you with all sincerity, if you read the whole story of Jesus in all of the Gospels, one of the things that you learn time and time again is that all throughout the life of Jesus, Jesus chooses mercy over law-keeping. Jesus always opts for mercy. And that's how we are to understand our Lord. Next comes the angel. Now, this angel is a very important character because the angel comes speaking for God. And I don't know about you, but if someone is speaking for God, I think it's a time to attend and pay attention. And the angel comes to Joseph and says, Joseph, don't be afraid to marry Mary. Everything going on in her life is God's doing, and the child that she carries is the child of the Holy Spirit. That's more important than it might seem for a number of reasons. First of all, the statement by the angel tells Joseph that Mary has not committed adultery. So technically, he's off the hook about keeping the law. And, and that's probably really great news for Joseph. But the second reason that it's very, very important might be something that you hadn't imagined or guessed before. And that is that because of the mention of the Holy Spirit, it means that Jesus' conception is not somehow sex between Mary and God. That happened a lot in Roman and Greek folklore. Those gods were always playing around in human lives. But this is not our God. Because of the mention of the Holy Spirit, it hearkens us back to the story of creation. And you remember in the story of creation, the, the text tells us that the void was all around. All of this was just there, and it was formless and purposeless and without life, and the Holy Spirit hovered over it, and from that brought life. It's a reminder to us that the conception of Jesus is like that of the creation. He is the begotten of Son of God by the Holy Spirit with the word of creation. He is, in fact, new creation. And so this God of ours is powerful and new. And I have to tell you that Joseph probably wasn't too hard to convince how do we know that? Well, we know it because he married Mary in the first place. But secondly, we know it because he accepted the name that the angel then gives him for Jesus. At that time, it was a powerful prerogative of the Father to name. And the willingness of Joseph to take the name that God has given him for the child recognizes his willingness to do just what God has said. Naming so crucial is even more powerful because when you look at the scriptures, what you see is that literally every person who's been named by God did wondrous and incredible things. That is an important person who was designed by God and expected by God to do magnificent and miraculous things. And so it holds out throughout all of the scripture. If you're named by God, you are important and you do important things. And Jesus, most of all, but it has bearing on your life as well. Because for every person who's baptized, what happens in your baptism is that God gives you a new name. It's not a new first name, as some people might suppose. It is a new last name. And the name is child of God. You are a child of God. AJ, child of God. Lynn, child of God. And that naming means that it's God who's named you. And it means that you're important. You're all important. You're baptized. You're important to God. And it means means that you will do magnificent, important, wondrous things in the house and the work of God. So never discount the importance of being a named child of God. That's the gift that God has given you for the living of your life so that your life will have purpose because it means that everything you do that is a part of your mission, if it's just being kind to someone or saying a nice word to a child or laughing with someone or helping someone with groceries or walking with someone across the street, whatever it is, bringing music to life or giving word to some pain, whatever it might be, it's important important and God has called you specially to do that. So see yourself in that way and your life changes fundamentally because it's about who Jesus is for you and for us. And finally, the next character doesn't seem like a character, but it's Jesus because of his name. And it really plays a role of character. It teaches us who this Jesus is for us. It's a piece of his identity because the angel says to Joseph, his name will be Jesus, which means he will save his people from their sins. 
Now you have this powerful mission for which Jesus comes in every part of his life. Every teaching, every miracle, every act that he does is designed for that. He is the one bringing salvation. And here's the beautiful piece of this. Matthew also tells us that the angel brings Emmanuel into it. A quote from the Old Testament, Isaiah. And this Emmanuel, which means God is with us, tells us that this one who is coming, this one who is here for us, this child whose celebration we so await is none other than God in the person, in the flesh. This is our God, the one who comes and dwells among us. And if you put all of these together, then you begin to recognize that Christ is the one, begotten as in creation, new creation, who was raised in a family which was righteous and merciful, and who overcomes the shame that surrounds our sinfulness, and who brings us to salvation, and that he is none other than God in the flesh. And when you know that, then your life changes. Because you see, it turns out that all of history comes to its intersection in this moment, in this person, in this life which was given for you. Past and present are redeemed in Christ. Future is determined and given to you in Christ. You know what waits for you, and it is salvation. So do you see it? The tree becoming a cross? Do you see it? Because it reminds us that the one on whom we wait and whose celebration we will soon engage is the very one who went to the cross to die for us and ensure our salvation. And when we know that, that's life, and we live in it. Amen. I will re invite you to remain in your seats uh, in the first part of the hymn of the day as the choir sings, and the offering will be collected during this part of the music. And then when it is time for us to join in the singing, David will signal us, and I invite everyone to stand for that.
worship continues with the Apostles' Creed, will you boldly confess your faith? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the people of God and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful gift to us in the birth of the Christ child in Bethlehem. While we try to focus on the, this gift, the busyness of the holiday season often gets in the way. Help us to stay present and focus on the true meaning of your gift of Jesus and help us remember that none of this would have been here this, this, uh, in this church today if you had not gifted us with the baby Jesus. There would be no Christmas, and much less hope, joy, and love without Jesus. As always, we have prayers for the success of your work through the ministries of all the people who serve this church. We pray for peace throughout the world, and we have special petitions for families of our church, for Doug and Paula Ebert, Judy Effler, Jim and Mary Eichinger, Justin, Caitlin, Megan Eichinger, Carter, Stephen, Tanya, Eide, Emma, Molly, and Cooper. We pray for the needy, the sick, and those for whom we have special requests in this book. And knowing that you always hear us, we have special concerns that we offer up to you during this period of silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. It is into your hands, O Lord, that we commend all for whom we pray and all for whom we have for forgotten or neglected to pray, trusting in the goodness of your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This meal is the Lord's, the table is the Lord's, and the invitation comes from the Lord. You do not have to be a member of this congregation to share in the supper. If you hunger and thirst for the Lord, you're invited to the table. Please come. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You comforted your people with the promise of a Redeemer, through whom you will also make all things new. In the day when he comes to judge the world in righteousness, and so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy God, God of power and might, and earth, of
Holy One, the beginning and the end, the giver of life. Blessed are you for the birth of creation. Blessed are you in the darkness and in the light. Blessed are you for your promise to your people. Blessed are you in the prophet's hopes and dreams. Blessed are you for Mary's openness to your will. Blessed are you for your son Jesus, the word made flesh. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it for them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ is To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. It is our Lord Jesus himself who has called us to this place. Let us pray as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Communion this morning will be continuous distribution, two lines up the center. Come now, for all is ready.
precious body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
the God of all grace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. In our closing and sending hymn, I invite you to enjoy the choir, and when it's time to sing, be standing.